can't think of a better song to introduce coming up here to preach the word, amen? So I, like, yeah, I don't know why we've never done that one before, before uh, uh, the sermon. <laughs> Uh, and also very fitting because uh, we just started our, our preach-off in our uh, Friday night devotionals with the church. So we actually, on Friday, we heard from Malik, from Joshua, from Julie, and from Diala uh, for a little preach-off. And, and Diala actually won, which was awesome. So, you know, it's getting uh, some fierce competition out there. In our preach-off, we're going to do it again this coming up week, and we'll see uh, who wins. Uh, of course, you know, friendly competition is good. It spurs us on to even greater things, and at the end of the day, we all love each other, so it's like a win-win situation. Uh, but, you know, uh, I don't know how you guys' works, work weeks were, uh, but uh, I want to start just talking a little bit about work, right, and some uh, statistics that come along with work. So I think... Everybody here has some kind of work that they do throughout the week, whether it be at a job or they're a student or just different obligations and responsibilities throughout the week. So something we can all relate to, right? Yes. You guys worked this week? Did something? Yeah. Amen. This mic stand is like a little... There we go. Um, so I looked up these stats, and um, they're more like averages, okay? So this is not like fully 100% true in every environment or every country or every age group. But check this out. 79% of employees reported not being fully engaged or not being productive for the duration of their eight-hour workday. Do you say that's probably accurate? So 80% of people say they're like not 100% there at work throughout the day. Relatable, relatable, I think. Um, employees reported an average of seven interruptions per hour during the work day. So in an hour's time, and they're trying to do, let's say, one task, there's usually seven interruptions. So even doing anything, even outside of work, I thought that might be fairly accurate. And each distraction taking approximately, on average, about five minutes. Okay, so that what that leaves in an, in an eight hour workday is only three hours of productive focused time during an, the eight hour workday with with those numbers, which is actually pretty shocking. Right. And this is, again, just on average. So what that means is we lose an average of eight hours of productivity due to distractions per eight hour workday. You lose four hours due to distractions. That's a lot. And not to mention the things that we should or could be doing outside of our work hours that would be more productive, right? So a lot of our days are lost due to distractions. Would you guys th agree that that's probably true for most of us to some degree? And this might be a little bit of the higher end, but I would say... Everybody, if you were to tally up like your iPhone tells you how much time you spent per app, how much time you spent per day on distractions, I bet you it would be shockingly high for all of us. You know, one of the biggest distractions that we have now is our phones, right? Uh, in a study in 2008 on social media, 45% of teenagers reported being on their phone, and I quote, constantly. Right? It was like, hey, several times a day, not much or very little. And then one category was constantly 45% teenagers said they're on their phone constantly, like all the time. Like they don't really remember a time in their day where they weren't on their phone in some way or the other. Crazy. 60 to 70% of adults use social media every single day, most reported several times a day. So even older generations, 60 70% every day, many times a day. Another study reports that, uh, and this is interesting, that productivity and happiness are correlated. Okay, productivity and happiness are correlated. So we spend a lot of time on distractions, and it actually makes us unhappy. But if we were to be totally focused for, let's say, eight-hour workday or whatever task it was that we're trying to do, we would actually report being more happy as a result. So I thought that was kind of cool. Being engaged and productive as an employee or a student 
makes us more happy, and not only more happy, but also there was stats to show, to show that it was more profitable, more profitable. There was a 21% increase in profit for employees who were engaged uh, for the majority of their workday or for the majority of their tasks. So now check this out. Profit is a byproduct of happiness, not the other way around. Profit is a byproduct of happiness. Happiness is not the byproduct of profit. You guys follow me here? So, so that's, that's huge. When we're happy, we actually make more money. And, and it's, it's because we're seeking like that, that joy in what we're doing. It's not the seeking after the money that then produces the happiness on the side. It's not actually not how it works, according to these statistics. So I thought that was interesting. And, and you know, here's the thing, and here's the spiritual connection. Profit is not just monetary. Profit can be spiritual. Profit can be physical. Profit can be emotional. But it is a, a growth and an adding on to in some way. So, church, when we're focused and engaged, it makes us happy and more productive, more profitable. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Uh, and it can seem kind of like basic, but, but like a lot of us don't operate that way. And we don't think about that way. And it's kind of even a subconscious thing. So I want to just, you know, help us to really understand that. Um, all profit are then the byproducts of work and happiness. All profit, all growth, all things that are added on to you is a result of work and happiness. And, and happiness means like having a good heart about what you're doing. Actually having some level of engagement and joy in what you're doing. It doesn't mean you're smiling all the time, but you actually want to do what you're doing. Okay, there's a, there's a, a heart that must be connected with the work that we do to have this result. All right, so work and the right heart or happiness produce profit. Just a little equation for you here before we, we get into the rest of the lesson here. Uh, turn with me to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I love psychology. So, you know, that stuff finds its way in here from time to time. We'll look at a couple more things as we go through our lesson today. Uh, but 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse 24, this is Paul speaking. He's talking to the Corinthian church. And I think he's reminding them of a similar message. He says in verse 24, 1 Corinthians 9, do, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beat in the air. No, I strike a blow to my body. I make it my slave so that I, after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is awesome. And we see Paul here in his heart towards his mission and calling from God. In fact, towards his just outlook on life itself. He says, man, I work hard. And I work hard like an athlete. And I try to, to not be distracted, but to be, to be focused on my goal. And isn't any high-performing athlete, this is their mindset. They cannot afford distractions. They're very disciplined people. They would not fall into the percentages and the categories that I shared with you in the beginning. They're after the prize. And Paul here, you can just feel his passion and his zeal as he communicates this message to the church to remind them he is fueled by his purpose and he considers it a joy. This is the same man who said, rejoice in your suffering. So this guy has that heart to really dig in and know why he's doing what he's doing and actually find joy through it, even the difficult parts, even the suffering. He says, like an athlete, I beat my body, I make it my slave. Like, that sounds like, like some, some hardship right there. But he's happy to do it. Right? So he's got this down. Hard work, 
the right heart, and surely there will be a great profit. And what is the profit that we're talking about here in terms of the scriptures? Well, he says, one, to preach to others so that they may be saved. Right? He says, hey, what I'm doing, I'm preaching to other people. That's what I'm after. And he says, hey, in, in all that, I have to take hold of it so that I am saved myself. So that I get the, not only them, but so I too get the prize. I'm not disqualified for the ultimate prize. And what are we talking about? Salvation. He's talking about getting to heaven and bringing as many as possible with him. That's the sport of a Christian. That's the sport of Paul. And that's the sport of you and I. The title for our message today is Keep Your Eyes on the Prize. Now, not super original, but very true and very relevant. So keep your eyes on the prize. Uh, now, Paul here, he writes this verse. And in the beginning, he says, he opens it up. Do you not know that all runners run? So again, he's reminding the church, like, hey, of course this is difficult. Of course, this is like a competition. Of course, you have to work hard. Do you not know? This is a little bit sarcastic right there, right? He's saying, like, obviously, this is how it is. So Paul, he, he has some of that stuff that he runs through his, his epistles, if you notice. He can be a little bit sarcastic, but it serves to, to, to give us also the culture and the teaching of the church. It's like, hey, you guys already know this, but let me remind you, right? Do you not know that, hey, it's like we're running a race here. And, hey, we got to go into strict training, right? And he gives an example, like, hey, just like runners, that's like us. So, church, it's no different for us today. But, you know, <clears throat> just like an athlete, as we spoke before, distractions can be very damaging to the race that we run. Distractions are very real. And just in the same way we can become distracted and unhappy and unproductive in our physical jobs that we even get paid for, and we even took a lot of time to, uh, to get into those positions, and we can find ourselves just throwing away four hours of the day, right? Well, we're, uh, someone is literally giving us money, and we still ha just can't keep focus. I I'm with you. Like, it's a normal thing. We all experience this. So how much more can we get distracted from our spiritual work to get to heaven and to bring as many others with us as possible, Amen. Right? I mean, I don't get a paycheck for that. Well, I guess I do because I lead the church. But it, it, and like before God, like I don't do this because he pays me, right? And, and honestly, I don't do this job for the money either, otherwise I would do something else. Um, but so, so how much, we're, we're, we got to really dig deep for that motivation and that focus and even more uh, keep an eye on the distractions that can so easily take us out. So my first point for us here is what are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? And I want to dig deep, and we're going to look at that motivation and see how it plays out in our daily lives. Because here's the thing, guys. We make decisions every day. We make choices that bring us closer to our goal. And this goes for anything, spiritual or otherwise. We make decisions all the time that bring us closer to our goal. Like the, the, what time we wake up, what we eat for breakfast, what time we leave the house, what route we go to get to work or wherever it is that we're going, how we talk to somebody. All of these things are choices that we make that lead us towards some kind of goal, some kind of outcome. Our decisions reflect our goals. Our decisions reflect our goals. And, uh, you know, it's very revealing, as I mentioned. Let me give you some examples here. If my goal is to, let's say, be in the NBA, all things are possible. All things. Very faithful. If my goal is to be in the NBA, but I only play 2K on the Xbox, do my actions reflect that this is really my goal? No, probably not. Probably more interested in, like, like, enjoying myself and having, you know, a little time to, to eat snacks and hang out with my friends. That's probably more of my goal, if that's what I'm trying to do. My goal, if my goal is to get a promotion at work, but I'm pretty lazy at my job and I fall in those categories of wasting about four hours a day and I show up late three or four times a week, is my goal really to get the promotion? No, probably not. It's probably to check my email and, and get a little extra minutes of sleep 
you know, this type of thing. I saw a meme the other day of like a dog just knocked out with his tongue hanging out. And it says, me throwing away my, my future promotion for two minutes extra sleep on my snooze button, right? And it was funny, but like, man, that's kind of true. Like, it's literally like that. Like, we will literally just, for that two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, even 30 minutes of extra sleep, like, risk being late to our jobs and never getting the position that we would like to have. Like, these are the decisions that we make. We don't even realize it sometimes. Like, what goal are we really after? If my goal is to gain muscle in the gym, but I choose to sleep through my alarm and miss gym a couple times of the week and eat whatever the heck I want, again, it doesn't really reflect... My goal of my goal is to get to heaven, church. But I live a lifestyle of sin. Can I really say I'm working toward my goal? Right? In my head, I can. In my heart, oh, I know it's true. But what am I actually doing? What do my decisions reflect? You know, there's an old saying. I don't know who said it. You reap what you sow. Right? I'm just kidding. It's Jesus. Jeez, but, but everybody knows that one, right? And sometimes we forget that, like, Jesus said that. Everybody knows that one. You know, because you know, it's so true, right? Everybody agrees. Like, that, that is what you, what you put in is what you get out, right? I remember learning that in school, in my statistics classes, right, for psychology. Uh, you, you, what you put in, if you put in not good input, if your, bad, your data is bad going in, guess what? You're going to get bad results, right? And that's a, a toned-down version of how it was taught to me, but um, Amen. That's very true. It applies to literally everything. What you reap exposes what you're really sowing. Okay? So the productivity that you see in your life is not a reflection of bad circumstances. It's a reflection of what we're putting into the soil. You know what I'm saying? So I think everybody suffers from uh, what's known in, in the psychology world of cognitive dissonance. You guys have heard of that? It's actually a pretty complex concept, so I'm not going to get into it too much, but the very basic definition is, uh, is uh, like when our actions or outcomes don't match our beliefs, but we pretend that they do. Okay? And, uh, you know, it's, we do this because it would feel bad or I would be sad or uncomfortable to actually recognize that what I'm doing does not match what I believe. That's a very uncomfortable place to be in. It's kind of shameful, and it's kind of like gives you a little anxiety, and it can make you angry sometimes at yourself, at other people. So instead of being in that place, we just pretend that although I'm getting all these funky results, I'm actually about what I'm trying to, to, to go after in my life, right? And it's cognitive dissonance. So I'm going to keep doing the wrong thing and expecting to get the result, and I'm just going to fool myself the whole way. Right? That is, that's what it is. Very basic version. But, uh, you know, this, is, this, this leads us to all kinds of, like, funny things, and we, we all do this. I do this all the time. We justify eating stuff that we should not be eating. Right? Tell us, oh, yeah, just this one time. Or it's late, and, uh, you know, nothing's open, and I know I've got food in the fridge, but, like, it might be old, and, ah, uh, you know, we justify sleeping a little bit longer. Well, you know, you know what? Well, if I just, if I just skip breakfast... Then I can sleep longer, and it's going to be okay, and it's not a big deal. Or, ah, you know, so-and-so was late yesterday, so if I'm late today, like, it's probably fine, right? And that's not what we told ourselves the night before. But we do these things in the moment. It sneaks right in there. Uh, we justify lateness. We justify job performance. We justify our attitudes. We justify giving in to impurity, into sin, into saying things that we should not have said, into not spending time with God when we're supposed to spend time with God. Right? Oh, I'll read my Bible later. Oh, this is more important right now. It's a priority. Right? We play these games. Instead of just saying, man, I need to change. Because that place is a little uncomfortable. Right? So we play that cognitive dissonance game. And uh, we don't want to actually sit in the, the conclusion that, wow, I really need to change. What I'm doing is not matching what I believe. My outcomes are not getting me closer to my goal. Yeah. Right? We've got to be okay with that space. It's okay. You are not alone. But you've got to admit that you've got a problem in order that's step one, right? And that's okay. we all got problems. we got lots of them. We, we, can, uh, we, can, <laughs> we, can, uh, we can definitely relate here. So, you know, I remember uh, this is a long time ago. 
but in college, I used to like uh, do like marker tags, just a little bit of a delinquent. And uh, I would tag, and I thought this was clever at the time. I thought I was like very spiritual and like deep. And I would tag, um, obey your God, right, on like bathroom walls or like somewhere that people would say, because it makes you think. It's like, what? Oh, obey my God? I don't believe in God. And then, you know, I think, well, maybe you do. Or who is my God, right? Or, you know, it raises these questions in people. I thought this was like clever. And even though I was like totally out to lunch spiritually, completely worshiping something totally else. Um, but, you know, we don't want to admit that we serve something other than like the God of the Bible or Jesus, or we serve something that we don't intend to serve, okay? But when we're producing something that is not what we actually want, we're serving that purpose and that goal. You know what I'm saying? So like that's a God. It's an idol in our lives, and we're serving it decision by decision by decision, right? So like let's just admit it. Let's just admit that's what we're serving. That's what really is important to us. So here's my challenge for you is to drop the cognitive dissonance and take a look at the, the God that you sometimes choose over Jesus. And like really for a second, think about that. And you're going to feel that cognitive dissonance kick in. Oh, no, I don't really do that. No, I don't really serve this God. Oh, it's just sometimes, but it's not like I really care about it. You do. And I want to just right now, just take that time to think about what is that God that's right next to Jesus that you sometimes choose over him, right? It could be anything. It could be self, sleep, food, sexual impurity, drugs, alcohol, money. It's right there. It's not not there. It's totally there for every single one of us. And, and feel that. Like recognize it. Look at it. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It's okay. Let's, let's take off the cognitive business and feel that, that space. And, uh, you know, let's stop rationalizing our way out of it and just be okay with being uncomfortable sometimes and then choose to fight for the God that you really want to serve, which I'm hoping for all of us is Jesus, is God the Father. But you got to look at the enemy and then say, okay, this is what's happening right now. Let me, let me make sure that I'm back on the path that, that I want to be on, which goes to heaven. Let me keep my eyes on the prize and keep fighting forward. Amen? Amen. On, Let's go. <laughs> Thanks, Dale. <laughs> yeah, you guys can clap if you want to clap at times. It's okay. I don't mind. Um, so, you know, this here, cognitive dissonance distracting us, making us think that we're doing something that we're not, is uh, one of Satan's biggest tools and, uh, that, that he plays around with in our minds to get us to, to, to forfeit the ultimate goal, right? He plays on our pride. He plays on our intellect to deceive us by having us believe our own lies, I mean, how more, much more insidious and powerful is that? He doesn't have to tell you the lie. He just puts you in a position where you make up your own, and then you believe your own lie. I mean, that's what he does, right? That's even what that is, that rationalizing, that justification. It's like I'm making up my own lie, and it makes me feel good, so I'm already anchored into this thing, like, good, right? It's no elaborate scheme. Like, he doesn't got to do nothing. He just lets you be in that space and maybe, you know, distracts you a little bit and lets you make up your own stuff to trap yourself in these type of things. Uh, we got to keep our eyes on the prize. Distractions, uh, distractions uh, will only make us fight the wrong battles. And uh, my second point for us here is who are you fighting against? And turn with me to 1 Samuel 17. Who are you fighting against? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to see David. And this is right before he comes down in his famous battle against Goliath, right? So right now, David's pretty much a nobody, biblically, in our storyline here. Uh, he's a shepherd boy. He's the youngest of a bunch of sons, all of which are taller and stronger and more notable than he is. But this lowly shepherd boy, he comes down to the battle because he hears about Goliath and his opposition against the Israelites. And he's asking some questions right here. So it says here in verse 26, 1 Samuel 17, verse 26, David asks the men standing near him, 
what will be done for this man, for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the enemies or the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Wow. Talk about some sibling rivalry right here. I don't know if any of us can relate to that with burning with anger and saying some kind of outrageous things to our siblings. You know, perhaps some physical altercations have happened in our past growing up with brothers and sisters. It goes down. It's real in the house. And, uh, you know, it's no different here for David and his brothers. So David comes down, and again, he's asking about uh, this Goliath. And uh, he's answering, David, maybe he doesn't even aware of it, but he's answering a call from God. Right? We know how this story ends. So God has brought David to this space, and he gets some opposition immediately in trying to answer God's call for him, but not from Goliath, from his own brother. In verse 28, at the end it says, why have you come down here? Right, so immediately David is faced with uh, this, this belittling from his brother, saying, oh, well, you don't even belong here. Why are you even here? You shouldn't be here. You're not even worthy of being here with this battle. You should be with the sheep. He says, and, and who have you left those sheep with in the wilderness? So now he's, he's slandering David. Like, man, you, you neglected your only task. He's probably trying to stir up some insecurity in David right here. Oh, man, what about my sheep? Should I have not done that? What are people going to think? Are they going to be okay? And then finally he just flat out says, you are conceited, wicked, lazy and all you came down here to do is watch you don't want to really know what's going on you're just gonna you're just a faker you're just gonna sit on the side and pretend like you care like man and even it opens up saying Eliab did this out of anger Eliab is in some serious sin right here and he's directing it all at David let's see what David's response is in verse 20 29 it says, David speaking, now, now what have I done? Can't I even speak? And then he turned away to someone else and brought the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. So David makes a pretty, uh, a pretty smooth little play right here. So he, he responds to Eliab just to let him know, hey, I heard what you said. But he doesn't entertain his nonsense. You know, he lets him know, hey, I heard you, but I'm not going to entertain it. And he just keeps it right now. He turns away, keeps it on moving. Right? How would you guys have responded if your own sibling, somebody who you cared about, who knew you well, was like, man, you're conceited, you're wicked, you're messing up at your job, you don't even belong here. You know, what, how would you feel? Yeah, I would be, I'd be, now I would be burning with anger, right, like Eliab. Uh, he just transferred that right on to me. And I probably have some words to say besides just these, these two little sentences before I, I left Eliab, uh, let him know what I really think. You know, but he doesn't do that. He said, you know, let's know I heard you, but he keeps it moving. Now, here's the thing. If David had got caught up fighting Eliab, defending himself to Eliab, his brother, he would have never made it to Goliath, the real enemy that he's being called to defeat. Right? And this is how Satan works. He throws all kinds of distractions and plays on your intellect, plays on your emotions to get you so you don't even see the real enemy. And Satan would have had the victory right here. He would have defeated David before David even got in the ring with Goliath. That's how he does it. Church, some of us are defeated by our distractions. And Satan is running amok and laughing at us while we are fighting each other, offended and, and, and offending 
defending ourselves and harboring bitterness toward each other, toward our own brothers and sisters and family members, justifying our actions because of our own insecurities, while Goliath is tearing down the people of God. And if we, like David, would just turn away from the distractions, the many, many distractions, if we would just turn away, instead of arguing with our Eliab, and we face the real enemy, and we put half of the energy that we put into defending ourselves and being offended into answering the real call God has had for each one of us, we would see our lives transformed, we would see our friends and families' lives transformed. We would see the city of Philadelphia transformed by the power of God. You know, David comes against Goliath in the name of the Lord. Right? That's what he says if you read on. He says, hey, in the name of the Lord, I come against you. And, of course, God gives him the victory. Right? But that's not what would have happened if he was fighting Goliath. God would have said, hey, that's, that's, I don't even ask you to fight that battle. What are you doing over there? Right? And then we get all caught up in our little stuff, and God's just like over here, like, hey, the ring is open, and you, you know, the, the contender's right there, like, whenever you're ready, like, let's do this, right? So my challenge for us is to stop fighting your Eliab. Figure out what that is. What is that distraction that's taking up your time and your energy and your heart? And, and, and you know, here, here's some of the ways you can, you can figure out if you're fighting Eliab and not Goliath right now. Uh, you're blaming people. You blame people for things, right? You're looking at all these little distractions and you're blaming people instead of looking at God. Uh, you talk more about people than about God, right? That's what occupies your mind and your heart. You're feeling a lot because you're focused on all these things. When God's saying, you know, if you just focused on me, we wouldn't even be talking about that stuff. You're trying to control other people and how they respond and how they think and what they do to you instead of concerning yourself with equipping yourself with the fruit of the Spirit and being who God's calling you to be. Don't worry about their battle. They got their own battles. They got their own lives and their own Goliath. And let's focus on, on you getting suited up with the fruit of the Spirit and ready. And lastly, I think if we're easily offended. When we're easily offended, we, uh, we give in to pettiness. Right? We have uh, very sarcastic things to say all the time. Uh, it's just not spiritual. It's not mature. And it's not focused on God. And those are not the battles that God wants us to be facing and battling and getting caught up in. That is not your battle. Right? That's a distraction from Satan. So, uh, yeah, church, identify your Eliabs and identify your Goliath. Right? Let's get focused on that fight, because that's on the way to the prize, not these other things. Uh, so I got one last point for you here, and uh, you know, all of what I'm talking about has to do with spiritual maturity. It has to do with spiritual maturity. And uh, you know, Josh, he did a little message on Friday about spiritual maturity, uh, the title of which I cannot repeat. It's just, it's just missing context. It wouldn't make sense. <laughs> it was good. Uh, <laughs> uh, spiritual maturity, and it's so important. And this is one of the things that uh, will, will make or break our walk with God, is if we're able to begin to mature and then continue to do so. And guys, spiritual immaturity affects our walk with God more than you think. Way more than you think. Uh, my third point for you is God brings the victory. God brings the victory. So again, when you're fighting your real battle, God will give you the victory. You don't got to worry about it. You just got to focus on him and not get caught up in the distractions. But think about this. This is uh, how, how, how this works sometimes with God. And, uh, you know, God fights our battles for us at the end of the day. We got to put ourselves there. We got to have the faith. We got to take the action. But God gives us the victory. God makes it grow. Uh, now, let me give this example. Give you a little bit of a different insight into how some of these things work. Because we all have our battles. Some of you wondering, okay, where's my victory? How am I going to get it? When is it going to come? I've been wondering these things for myself. And, uh, you know, it happens. We get into those seasons sometimes where it's like, all right, God, any time now, I'm ready. I'm ready. You do this, and you do that, and you do this, and you do that. And like, all right, and it's just not happening. It doesn't happen. Okay. And I was doing a little, a little research on this, looking at some scriptures. And uh, before I get into the scriptures, I just want to give you this example. Let's say somebody comes over to your house, right, a good friend of yours, someone you really care and love, 
And uh, they ask you, they're hungry, they ask you for a meal. So you, you cook them up, maybe you give them the rest of your leftover, you're going to eat that for dinner, but you know what, I'm going to help out my friend here, I'm going to give him this food, I'm going to heat it up. And let's say they take like two bites of it, and then they, they you know, get distracted with something else, or, and then they leave. And you have half of the meal there, half eaten, and you're like, dang, okay, and you just toss it out. It's too bad, amen, I guess, I don't know what happened there. They come over again. And they say the same thing, hey, I'm hungry, can you make me something to eat? And they go, yeah, of course I can, of course. And you, you maybe you, you make some stuff, you spend a little time, you give it to them, and they're like, ah, oh, I don't like it. Oh, I'm good, I'm, I'm going to eat later, I'm going to go to McDonald's when I, on the way home. <laughs> and you have this meal, and they like picked at it, so you're like, okay, and you throw that one away. Right? And they come over again, and they do the same thing. And they don't eat the food, and you throw it away again. Then the fourth time, they come over and they say, hey, can you make me some food? I'm hungry. How are you going to feel at this point? Do you want to give them the food? No. 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 Like last times I gave you, and th like this happens to me sometimes, okay? Like I'll give somebody something. Oh, you're going to really love this. It's great. It's my last one. And I want you to share in this joy of how good this is. And they don't even eat it. Or it's like, you know, or they, you know people have drinks and they leave half drank drinks at your house at a party. And you're just like dumping out drink after drink after drink case right i love these but i mean i can't i don't know who was drinking it or covid going around like you just dump all this stuff out it's a big waste it, it's yeah it makes me struggle a little bit maybe you can relate i don't know it bothers me um so guys sometimes we can take the gifts and the blessings and the victories the answered prayers from god that he gives us because we ask and we can let it spoil he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives, and then we just let it get thrown away. We don't appreciate it. We don't enjoy it. We don't finish what he gives us. We ask for it, and then we ask again, and then we ask again, and we ask again, and eventually God's like, look, I've given you the stuff, but you're not using it. You're not taking the victories that I give you and bringing it to completion. You're not give, taking the blessings and using it for, for my glory, let alone even advancing yourself. Why would I keep blessing? You're not getting it. You're not getting it. Uh, turn with me here to a couple of scriptures. We're going to run through quickly. I'm just about done here. Um, Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59, verses 1 through 2. It says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is his ear too dull to hear, but your inequities have separated you from your God, your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Our sin actually blocks our prayers from being heard by God. And it's not that he doesn't not want to hear us, but it's our sin that causes a separation. I turn with me here to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So God gives and he gives and he gives, and then we waste it away. We, we ask with a bad heart. We ask and then we just spend it on our own pleasures. You know, I, we don't have to turn there, actually stay here in James. But in 1 Peter chapter 3, for anyone married out there or even uh, dating and hoping to be married sometime soon, the scripture says in 1 Peter 3 verse 7, it says, Husbands, treat your wife's right as a gracious gift. I'm paraphrasing here. As a gracious gift, that nice, awesome meal that was prepared for you, a gracious gift. You don't deserve this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. This is my dinner, but you can have it. And it says, you don't treat your, your wife's or even your husband's the right way, so your prayers are hindered. That's what it says. That's what it says. It says, because of the way that we treat each other, God doesn't answer our prayers. Wow. In James 5, 16, the last scripture that we'll look at here, James 5, 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Right? It does not say the prayer of somebody who's in sin every single day and is unrepentant and doesn't really care and is taking the last ten blessings and throwing them in the trash. It doesn't say that those pa- prayers are powerful and effective. It says the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. So, you know, church, we love the message of, like, forgiveness and grace and all this redemption, and that's all true and that's all good, but there is great value and power in us actually living righteous lives. And in fact, we hinder the power of God in our lives when we're not righteous. We wonder, why are my prayers not being answered? Why is there no power in my Why don't I feel spiritually healthy? Well, perhaps because there's sin in your life. We got to value righteousness. And uh, church, you know, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, you will be sinless and perfect and only then will God answer your prayers. Although that's good and that is the goal. That is what we should strive for. That's Jesus right there. We're always trying to be more like Jesus every single day. That is the standard. I think about David when he sins with Bathsheba. He commits adultery. He commits murder. He, he totally throws away even his, his focus on the kingdom of God. And, and God is about to strip everything away from him. But he prays earnestly. He repents. God answers his prayer and restores him to his position. Right? So even in our sin, we can have a heart of righteousness to repent. And God hears those prayers. Right? It doesn't matter where you're at today. It doesn't matter what you've done. You can repent. You can go after confession. You can go after redemption. And God will surely hear your prayer. But guys, this is, this is the scriptures. This is the biblical truth of prayer and our relationship to God and how we can communicate with him in a way that he actually hears us and answers our prayers. Okay? So uh, to close out, church, uh, let's keep on fighting. God will certainly bring the victory. And let's keep our eyes on the prize. And we'll surely uh, see him do incredible things uh, in our lives and the lives of those around us. Um, At this time, so thank you very much. Um, (laughs) 